All right. Hello, folks, and welcome to Anatomy of a Kubernetes Release, Success Through Team and Tools. Um, as you can see, this is part two. We actually gave the part one section of this talk at the Open Source Summit China uh, virtual event. Um, so if you missed that, um, I'm sure you can go back and check that out at this time. Uh, we talked about in that talk a little bit about um, kind of the overall structure of SIG release for Kubernetes. Um, today, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the technical side of things, specifically in the release engineering subproject. Um, my name is Daniel Mangum. I am the CI signal lead for the Kubernetes 1.19 release. I'm also part of the release engineering subproject um, and a branch manager, which uh, we can talk about what that is in a little bit. And I'm joined today um, by Sasha Grunert, who is the tech lead um, for SIG release and is also a branch manager and part of uh, the release engineering sub project. So we're excited to tell you a little bit about what we kind of do on a daily basis and also hopefully how you can get involved and understand um, a little bit of the areas where we are looking for new contributors and that sort of thing. So without any further ado, I'll go ahead and jump into our content here. So a brief overview of what we're talking about today. Um, we're going to look at how we actually technically make Kubernetes releases. So there's a lot of team and process um, that goes into things, a lot of different roles, roles that folks play. Um, but today we're going to talk exactly about, you know, the commands we run, the tools we use, um, and what actually happens to make that uh, binary available for you to download. Um, we're going to give a overview of the release engineering sub project. So this is a sub project of SIG release specifically around building the tooling um, and, and running the actual releases as well as making sure um, branches for different releases are up to date uh, and, and running patch releases and that sort of thing. And then Sasha is going to take over and do a bit more of a deep dive into the tooling, uh, where the tooling lives, how it's developed, how it's versioned, um, and how it's used to do different parts of the release process, and, and how we're continuing to make that more seamless um, and a more robust tool um, to be able to use for Kubernetes and, and also increasingly for other projects as well. As I mentioned before, this is the second part of this talk. So if you'd like a more broad overview of SIG release, uh, please go check out the previous talk that we gave, and there's a link for that below. All right, so giving you kind of just an overview of the different roles of folks in the release engineering subproject, and this has actually changed pretty recently, so you're getting very up-to-date information. Um, so, so we used to have a branch management team and a patch release team. So you can imagine um, in Kubernetes, there are release branches for, for every release. And in Kubernetes, we support the last three releases. Um, so it's a rolling cycle. When a new release comes out, we drop support um, for, for the third oldest um, in that cycle. And there's so there's two main roles here. One of them is branch management, which is basically making sure we're getting the release branch ready for the next release. Um, then there's the patch release team, which is making sure necessary fixes um, and improvements are made on those uh, older versions of Kubernetes um, and, and patching those over and then making those patch releases. Uh, as you can see, their branch managers usually cut minor releases and follow the release cycle. And the patch release team takes care of cherry picking um, some of those fixes that need to be included in previous releases, especially if they're security vulnerabilities or bugs or things like that. Um, Recently, the patch release team and branch management team has actually been consolidated into one. Um, as you've kind of heard me talk about some of the different responsibilities, you can imagine how there's a lot of overlap there. So a lot of expertise you gain in using the tooling and running some of these releases is really applicable to both roles. Um, so having more folks around that are able to help out with both of these responsibilities uh, is just more advantageous to the project. Um, so those have consolidated recently. So folks like Sasha and myself um, help out on both of those sides sides of things. All right, so looking at the actual tooling that we use to run this release, so the commands we run, the what actually happens behind the scenes, all of that sort of thing, um, all of this tooling lives in the Kubernetes release repo. So um, you can see the link to, to the GitHub repo right there. Um, so anything that happens there, any of the issues that are tracking improvements we want to make, any of the PRs are opening or happening against that repo. Um, and it contains tooling for um, interacting with GitHub, interacting with um, uh, Google Cloud Build, um, all the different services that we use. Um, increasingly, it's becoming a little more generic so that those libraries that we write to be able to interact with those services um, can rapidly be used to iterate on new commands and new functionality. Um, so that's one of the things that's going right now. And um, you'll see there that uh, it's a big transition from bash to go. So 
there's a number of advantages for this. But before I get into that, um, one thing to mention is, you know, why was all of this written in Bash? Well, like your typical project that you've probably started, uh, it's really easy to get started just using Bash scripts and, and they'll get you most of the way. Um, as Kubernetes has become more uh, production ready um, and, you know, since the 1.0 release where it's really increased in adoption, there's a desire to have a more testable release tool um, and a more robust release tool as it does more things and the kind of complexity of releases increases. Um, also, there's just a lot of folks who are familiar with how to write Go. It's a very approachable language. So transitioning to a Go-based tool um, is a little bit easier to get new contributors in and, and make more rapid progress. Um, so that, that process is still ongoing. Honestly, it's something that will probably last for quite some time because a lot of these um, scripts touch a lot of different parts of the Kubernetes code base. Um, but it's a very easy and approachable way for new folks to get involved. It's personally how I got involved uh, with lease engineering at first is just trans transitioning some of that functionality from the bash scripts over to Go. Um, we do follow a workflow based approach for the tooling. So um, as I mentioned before, the uh, functionality is is attempted to be abstracted into general purpose libraries. Um, so what that looks like is if we need um, to transition a bash script that goes and generates release notes from all the PRs um, that have been merged into the master branch. Um, there is some generic tooling that we can use there. So likely what we're doing is interacting with GitHub, pulling down some of those PRs, inspecting some of their content, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of that functionality can be abstracted into general things that we can use to interact with GitHub. And then if we later on want to do you know, more sophisticated things like inspect labels or do something like that, we already have some of that library and, and shared knowledge built out um, and we can add new, new functionality really quickly. Uh, the tooling also helps facilitate that merging of the two roles that I talked about before of the patch release team and the branch management team. Um, obviously, if you're using a consistent single tool um, to be able to execute all of these different steps that are required for both patch releases and alpha, beta, RC, and official releases, um, if you're using the same tool for that, it's just a little bit easier to context switch. You also get things like helpful tooling um, that you know tells you what you need to provide for a command and, and helpful um, messages and usage messages um, for the different commands um, in the tool. So um, now to actually take a look at what the tool is, um, the, main, the main heart of release engineering is CREL. Um, so you'll see that's short for Kubernetes Release Toolbox. Um, so Basically what this is, is a single command line interface that does all of these different things um, that are required for these different roles in release engineering. So you'll see an example of some of the commands um, below, like generating the change log, sending emails even to mailing lists, um, that sort of thing. So having this single command, uh, number one gives us a single binary that we can version and release. So um, just behind the scenes, we usually open an issue uh, before we make any release and we kind of uh, detail the steps there as we go through the release process. Um, and so we can have generic things like you always run, you know, crawl mock stage here um, in, in this process. And so we can use those generic commands as opposed to just kind of doing like one off bash scripts or running things in UIs. Um, so so this is really useful. Uh, as well, this this crawl command line tool can also be used by um, processes. So if you want to use it um, as part of a job that runs in Prow or something like that, um, it can also be automated and used for uh, facilitating those types of workflows. So really flexible tool. Um, and we're continuing to build out some of the functionality there. So if you're interested in getting involved, um, definitely check that out. Um, now I'm going to hand it off to Sasha, who's going to talk a little bit more about these specific commands and what happens um, in a release and um, what kind of the sequence of commands that you may run as a release manager would look like. So Sasha, feel free to take it away. Thanks, Dan. Great overview so far. So before we dive actually into how to cut a Kubernetes release, I have prepared a short demo for you. I would like to talk a little bit about the theoretical aspects and how it, how it works in general. So if we look at the release cycle, then we usually have to cut yeah, alpha releases, beta releases, so some pre-releases. Then at some later point in the release cycle, we will create a release candidate. And from that release candidate on, we will also create a release branch, which got management managed afterwards by branch management. And at some later point at the end of the release cycle, we usually cut the final release. Otherwise it would not make much sense at all. 
Um, in between, we also have some patch releases. So usually they come on a monthly basis. And since we were able to unify our tooling, we were also able to unify our participants. So we have in the green boxes here the branch management and the patch release team, which are just separated. But in general, right now they use the same tooling and they also can rely on the same, yeah, on the same environment. So from a tooling perspective, we can see that we have the Cradle release toolbox. And inside the Cradle release toolbox, as Dan already mentioned, we have, for example, Cradle GCP manager and Cradle GCP manager is, um, yeah, stands for Google Cloud Build Manager. And th this has been completely rewritten in Go to be actually testable. But then Cradle GCP Manager um, will get executed locally on, on your local machine. This will call a, a, will trigger a Google Cloud Build build actually, which uses Enego. And Enego is part of our technical depth. So it's a huge bash script, which actually yeah, for example, builds artifacts and puts them into release buckets. Enago will also call into Corel changelog. So this is also pretty new. And Corel changelog takes care of, yeah, modifying the Kubernetes release repository, generating the changelogs, and then putting back those data in for Enago. And Enago will take those outputs like Markdown and, yeah, and also modifications on a Git repository, and we'll put it into the repository at all. So that sounds a little bit complicated, but what? how do we actually cut a release? Um, as Dan already mentioned, we have to create an issue to cut a release in Kubernetes SIG release so that everyone from SIG release is aware of that we are going to plan to cut a release. I will show you that later on. And then we just have to run four steps. So we have to go to mock stage, mock release, stage, and release. So <clears throat> mock stage and stage are usually the same steps, but um, the mocking is just executed in a non-disruptive um, way. So we don't actually, we just build artifacts, for example, but we don't put them into production. And all everything else, will be done automatically. So for example, cutting release, creating release branches, building the artifacts, putting them into the right directories will be all done automatically. The release manager just has to take care of that. It, that it's executed in the right order. And what does stage do? So stage just verifies that the build environment is correctly set up. It sets the right build versions. I will show you that later on. And it will also build the releases via kubecross, which is a container image. And this produces binary artifacts, container images. And we will also create some release nodes. And then we put all those data into a bucket, in a Google Cloud bucket. And the release step will later on take those data and yeah, will push the Git repository changes like the tags, the actual change logs to GitHub. And it will also update the GitHub release page, and then it will also push the container images into the gcr.io registry for consuming from end users. Then we have also to create a, create a release announcement, and this is a separate step. Um, the release st uh, stage will pre-create the release announcement for us and will archive um, the release on the Google Cloud Storage. So why do we have to do it in a separate step? Um, usually we do it at the announcement in a separate command, like called Corel announce. Um, this is also has been written from, in, from a new perspective and we have to do it because we also want to create some dApps and RPM packages. And those packages are currently built by Google build admins. And we usually have to reach out to them that they help us to build the packages and then we can send out the announcement. So there's a slight delay and we are going to automate that away in the future. And maybe in one year, we, are, we can also have uh, directly send the announcement right after the release or directly in the release would be really, really cool. Um, yeah, we use, we stick to ZendCrit, um, which sends the mail to the right mailing list. So the Corel announce tool is highly workflow driven, as Dan already mentioned. So there is no need to do any other interaction than just uh, exporting a ZendCrit API key, and then the announcement will be put into the right place. So this whole release cutting process will be done for each alpha, beta, and release candidate during the whole cycle. So we do it multiple times. And the same um, process applies to patch releases as well. But now we can have a look at a real life example and I can just share my screen for you. 
And if we now look into Kubernetes sick release in the repository, then we can see that right now somebody cuts a 119 RC2, which is pretty exciting. And I would like to say, okay, if I want to cut a new release, then I just can create a new issue. And then we have our template for cutting a new release. So it's pretty handy already. We just have to fill out some basic information when it will happen. And we have to screenshot unhealthy release branch test grid boards. And then we have a checklist which guides us through the overall release. So we have all four release steps, mock stage, mock release, stage, and release. And after that, we can cut the packages and send the announcement. And that's basically it. If we now look at the previous release, which is 119RC1, and then we can see that this already happened some weeks ago. And uh, the table is already filled out. So some release manager, Carlos in that case, and run mock stage, we are create GCP manager, minus minus stage, and then some command line flex. Well, how do they these command line flags look like? If we just look at the help page of Krell GCP manager, then we can see that there are some flags which are necessary. And the most important flags are, for example, stage and release. So we have to specify if we want to stage or to release. And also the no mock flag is, can be used in comb combination with that. And the branch is necessary if we want to cut a release not against the master branch. For example, release candidates would be cut against the release branch. And that's the basic command execution. And usually, how does it look like? So if we just create a mock stage release, then we can go into Google Cloud. And this looks like this. So we are here on Google Cloud build. Um, and it executes the whole build job. So we can see the build gets started. Then it's cloning the release repository. Let me just skip that. It's not that exciting. It will build Krell locally. And then it will check the prerequisites. So we just check out what yeah, what Krell version do we have in, at hand right here? So this is all executed directly in Enego. Then Enego will set the build version, which is kind of a Jenkins build version. This is that one. And then it will already find out which release is going to build. So we can see, okay, Enego found out that we want to build 119RC1. And it will also point us to some uh, open PRs at the release for the release branch which are not necessary at that point. Um, and then it will start to prepare the workspace. And preparing the workspace is nothing more than just cloning Kubernetes, Kubernetes. And yeah, checking if the, if the disk space is available and then we'll create a tag. So that's the first, the first thing. It will check out the release branch and it will create the tag on, on, on that release branch. And then it starts to call into cube cross, which actually builds the artifacts. So those artifacts, as already mentioned, are in the first place, the binary artifacts, for sure. So we have to build Kubernetes for Linux, uh, AMD64, and different other architectures as well. And then if that is done, let me just scroll down a little bit. We also have to create container images. So here we can see that it's starting to build the container images for the Cube API server for AMD64 and also some other architectures as well. This will happen all on that build job. After that, we just generate the release notes. Here we can see the output from generating the release notes for the release candidate. It will also create an HTML, which will be later on used for the release announcement. And it will commit the release nodes into the release branch as well as the master branch. Then this whole source tree gets staged to GCP. Um, and that's pretty interesting because we have two different buckets for mocking and non-mocking. And this is the job for the, for the actual release. And we can see that the artifacts will land on Kubernetes release. And if we now look into that bucket, so this is the Kubernetes release bucket, then we can see that we have different directories here. And for example, we have this staging 
directory. So now I just can check for 119.0 RC0. This is the build version, which will create it by Enigo automatically. And then we can see that it will put the source tarball in here and also the artifacts. So if we browse a little bit down here, then we can see that we have some images, yeah, MD64, for example. And then we can see that we have the cube API server and the cube proxy and all other container images with, which has been built during the release. The same applies to the binary artifacts. So if we look to GCP stage RC1, then we can see that we also have, for example, the Kubernetes client for 368 here. And everything is in and looks pretty good. And I already downloaded for us the tarball. And if we look at this tarball, then we can see, so it's that, that tarball, and I extracted it here, that there's the release, in our, um, release HTML in there, and we have a full Kubernetes repository in. So if we look at the current state of the, this repository, then we can see that we are on the release branch and that we have a commit on top of that, which just updates the change log to 119RC1. So we have all those change log modifications in here. And that's basically the state uh, for the end state for the staging, for the staging step. And now we can go ahead and have a look into the release execution. So let's assume we this has been finished and was successful. Then we would have to run the release stage. Yeah, and the release stage just um, requires the build version. And we run crel gcp manager minus minus release minus minus no mock and then specify the, the RC and the build version. And this is how the output looks like. We just have the same steps like preparing the workspace, compiling Corel, running Enago. And after that, we can just push the Git objects. So we actually push the RC1 tag into the official Kubernetes repository. And we also update the release branch. So then we just print out a diff which shows us now that the change log has been modified and will point to the binary artifacts, which are on DL Kates IO. But th those are not actually available at this point. They have to be promoted to the actual release in inside this release bucket. So we have to push the binary release artifacts from the release candidate. And this means we push the, the container images like done here. And we also have to move the, the binary artifacts into the right place to be down, to be able to download them directly via the change log. After that, we update the GitHub release page. And then we have our usual GitHub release page, which points to the change log. And then we archive the release on, on Google Cloud. So if we now look into the release bucket, so this is the same, the same Kubernetes release bucket. We don't go to stage. We just have a look into release. And then we can check for 119RC1 down here. And there we can see that all those artifacts are now available here and we can download them. So they are ready to be consumed from end users from that point on. And we also have in the Kubernetes release some updated version markers. For example, latest uh, 119 TXT should, should show us something like the latest available release, which is 119 RC1 in that case. Yeah, so from that point on, we can consume, this is the change log, the change log artifacts, like all those here. And then we usually have to build the depths and RPMs. And after that has been done, we can use CREL announce. I can just show you the help page to that as well. 
we have to export a Zencrit API key, and then we just you have to run Krell announce, and Krell tries to find out the right email and ch checks the right um, correspondence in this email, and then after that it will push the announcement out, which is based on that HTML I recently showed to you. And this looks like this. For example, we are on Kubernetes announce, and then we have the announcement that Kubernetes 119 RC1 is now live. And yeah, that's basically the content from the HTML change log with some yeah, short hints to the actual change log file and who created this mail. Okay. Let me check that out. So what are our future plans? So one of our biggest plan is to transform all those bash into a Golang based version. It's not that easy. I must admit we have a lot of technical depth and for example, finding out the right release version and yeah, looking up the right remote locations to find the set of information to create a release is not as easy as it may look like. And everything should be tested. And this is a raw, a huge drawback we have right now. We are not that able to re actually test changes on our bash scripts. But we try to improve on that on that part for sure. And then we would like to further automate the release process. For example, yeah, the release cut the release cut issue usually could be automated. This is really would be really, really nice that we just use a command line tool which automatically updates the issue for us. And yeah, for sure, also cutting the devs on RPMs is something we have in our mind. We're also working on a tool like it's called QPKG, and this should take care of cutting depths on RPMs for us and promoting them to the right locations. We also have some new features in mind, for example, like yeah, adding container image artifacts to the changelog file. They are currently not part of those changelogs. Um, for example, also adding CVE information to the changelog could be also pretty a pretty nice feature. Yeah, and as already mentioned, make QPKG able to cut and publish depth and RPM packages automatically. And I think that's it. I hope you get it, got a good overview about how we cut releases and how the technical part looks like. And now I would like to hand over to Dan for a wrap up. Oh, I think we jumped too far there. There we go. Uh, thanks for, for that really informative demo and for walking through all of that, Sasha. I, I imagine this is going to be a nice resource for folks. Um, as they come back and watch the recording of this talk. So um, I'm excited that we now have this out there. Um, for anyone who has um, stayed along this whole way, um, we definitely are looking for more folks to jump in and contribute. Um, if you are interested in that, please feel free to um, go and look at the issues in the Kubernetes release repo um, and you know say that you're open to working on one of them or reach out to me or Sasha directly. Um, we're in Kubernetes Slack and on Twitter and that sort of thing. So definitely feel free to reach out. Um, and I think with that, we can go ahead and move into a Q&A session um, for anyone who has questions about what we just talked about or questions in general um, about the whole Kubernetes release process. Hey. Uh, unfortunately, Dan can't join today to answer any questions, but I'm here to answer all of yours. So first of all, the first part of the talk was recorded at Cloud Native Virtual Summit in China and will be available at the end of August. And I will post the link to the schedule and then we can you can watch the first part if you missed it. So let's go over to the first question. So which branches branches are used for what purpose? Oleg asked this. Yeah, we have two types of releases. So first of all, we have new minor releases, which is for example, 119.0. And then we have patch releases, which is, for example, yeah, one eighteen dot six or seven, which has been released last week. And for the purpose of patch releases, we usually stick to the release branches. So release one eighteen is for one eighteen patch releases, and release one seventeen is for one seventeen patch releases. And then we, uh, during the create the release cycle, which takes around about three to four months, um, we usually create release branches, new release branches for the uh, actual release. So first of all, we create releases from the master branch, and then we create a release branch where we just continue cutting our releases during the cycle. Next question, also from Oleg. Um, how uh, 
is release cutting happening and our features going to be cherry picked into new release in the, into the release branch. Yeah, exactly. That's how it works. We, during the cycle, we create a new release branch. Then we fast forward that branch or sync it up with the master branch. And so it doesn't mean that we, if we create a new release branch, that your feature won't land into the release. So we sync them up. And this is our quality gate that we can decide when we want to have um, a new fast forward of the release branch, for example. And then we, at some certain point, we decide to only allow cherry picks into the release branch. And from that point on, some other quality measurements has, have to be already in place, for example, documentation and stuff like that. Next question. How do you manage dependencies between features? Um, yeah, usually the developer of the feature has to take care of this, but we get a lot of help from other SIGs as well. For example, from SIG architecture or from the dedicated code owners or from API review who helps us to decide when, uh, when it's usually sensible to merge what and in which, which order. So yeah, usually it works pretty well. And for that, we also have something like a release milestone for 119 is the 119 milestone. And then we can decide, okay, we have to merge those three PRs, for example, to actually land, land the whole feature. Pablo asks, um, all features in the master branch, are all features from the master branch automatically in the release? May it happen some, that something is going to be removed in, re in the release, for example, due to stability reasons. Usually we don't remove anything. We have the deprecation policy in uh, Kubernetes in place. So if something already was inside of, of a release, then we are not able to remove it up to the, to the next release. If we encounter something like regressions, then we, yeah, then we have to cherry pick those into the release branches. And in general, yes, every feature which is tracked. So the enhancements sub team of sick release takes care of that. So every tracked feature will also land in the master and this will go, in, go into the release. So there's always a little bit room for exceptions. For example, we can say, okay, some pull request is absolutely necessary, but they missed the deadline from uh, one or two days. And then we can say, okay, let's just raise an exception request and then approve it afterwards. That's also possible. Next question, is testing the main reason for going to go? So did you consider using bets? Yes. So testing, so no, we did not consider using bets, but we have um, our CI signal sub team, which tracks the overall CI health status of the release branches and also on the uh, actually master branch. And then we decide uh, if master, for example, we have multiple categories of tests. We have master informing and master blocking, for example. And if a test is failing in master blocking, then we usually will not have a chance to cut the release. So we have to stabilize the CI before we have a chance to do, do the actual release cut. Yeah. Okay, we have three minutes left. I think I can answer all those questions. Next question. Can you please show how to generate release notes again? Oh, <laughs> oh, um, there is an, an, an follow up talk in one and a half hour about the next generation of release notes. It's from me and <laughs> you will have a chance to see the generation of the release notes there. Definitely. And then uh, if that's not enough, then I'm happy to show you in person how, how we generate the release notes. Sure. How do you handle multi arch architectures in the release? Um, there are two types of multiple architectures. So the first type is the container images. So for container images, we use the multi pre-built multi arch binaries and use something like Docker build X to build multi architecture images, which works pretty well. And the binaries are built by cross compilation. So we have a dedicated container image called cube cross and cube cross can take care of cross compiling the release artifacts as binary artifacts for us. Next question. Oh, very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you for the nice feedback. Um, do you feel like this pattern of releasing could apply to some other artifact based release as well? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, our current strategy of building releases is highly bound to Google Cloud resources. We also don't use something like Docker Hub or Quay. We just stick to the Google Container Registry and promote our images there. 
This is pretty new, for example. We decided to use the community infrastructure to regularly push our container images to a staging repository. And from that staging repository, we promote the images into gcr.io slash Kubernetes minus API server 1.18, something like this. And so it's highly customized from my perspective. Um, but I think the pattern behind the technical aspects of cutting releases can be really be, can be reused as well. All right. I think that's it from the questions. I'm in the kubecon maintainer sub channel and there's a thread for this talk. And if you have any other questions, then I'm happy to answer them as well there. Yeah. Thanks. See you. <laughs>